and I think things can change quickly. And the answer to that, who knows, as I said, one can't predict the future, but I think at least um, for now it's worth a fight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wendy Bacon. I also remember those days in Victoria Street. I think they made a movie about it, The Killing, the killing of Angel Street. I think that was one of them, anyway. Um, now, our fourth speaker, as advertised, is Bob Vinicom. Bob Vinicom is an ardent campaigner for human rights in China and maintains the China Information website, chinainformation.com.au, which contains, it's also... Uh, I've got the details here if you want it. It also contains a plethora of information regarding human rights in China today. Bob Binnikin has spoken at two previous uh, roundtable forums here, China Image and Reality, September 2008, and Afghanistan, yes or no, uh, November 2010. So he has a forgiving nature. He has come back to us again. Uh, and it's anticipated that Bob may approach the subject, the future of the left, from a unique and interesting perspective. Thank you, Bob. Well, thank you, David. Uh, somebody just asked me, did you used to be in one nation? That's what. I actually do know a man with xenophobia. Xenophobia is the fear of getting food poisoning at a Greek restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe an irrational aversion to an independent South Australian politician. <clears throat> and actually, I understand the traditional owners of this land here on now is now the Macquarie Bank. Because the Macquarie Bank is for the mining rights and they're going to mine for coal seam, coal seam, coal, coal seam gas right under Parliament House. So that all the, the whole Parliament one day just sinks into the ground. Don't be surprised. And that'll be a real budget black hole. Good on you, Bob Carr. But yeah, to get those serious issues, to go on to something that's very, very comical, the future of the left. So I think the left's got a great future. They control the education system. Most journalists are pro-Labour or pro-Green. Bob Brown only has to sneeze and he gets in the newspaper. The public service is largely controlled by, by the left-wing people. Yeah. The left controls academia. They control the justice system, the legal system. We've got judges who put people in jail for four years and trying to form a political party. The same judges let criminals out on the street because they say society is to blame. Even public funding of elections, <coughs> which only came in in the 1970s, is the way the powers that be can use taxpayers' money to get themselves, themselves re-elected the next time. Even the registration of political parties, which only came in the 1970s, is a way of making it harder for people to form political parties and get them to Parliament, as we saw with the way Pauline Hanson and David Eckridge were put in jail. They've got their anti vilification laws in place um, to prevent criticism of themselves yes. in the same way as uh, having in, um, you've got to be politically correct, just like it used to be in the old Soviet Union. Yes. Uh, and as I always seek to show, the so-called conservative parties have also adopted part of their agenda. Now, how does this happen? You can't overestimate the radicalising effect of the Vietnam War. You of Australia and America had the prospect of being conscripted and sent to Vietnam and told to shoot people called communists. And they said, well, if we're going to shoot people because they're communists, maybe we better have a look at this communism business and see what it's all about. Maybe it's not so bad after all. And during the Vietnam War, from the beginning, the forces of freedom lost the propaganda war from the start. As an academic at Sydney University said, the Battle of Trafalgar was said to be one of the playing fields of Eton, and the Vietnam War was lost on the campuses of American universities. I was at Sydney University, 1969 to 1971, at the height of the moratoriums, students were a democratic society, the Sydney University Labor Club and so on. And I saw people from middle class conservative backgrounds brought up, they were brought up in the Reader's Digest view of communism, suddenly waving Viet Cong flags, talking about American imperialism, and saying a victory by the North Vietnamese would be a good thing. Gough Britain was partly brought to power by the Vietnam War. Despite the Holocaust of three million Cambodians murdered by the Khmer Rouge, the Vietnam War death ended up giving many people a rosy picture of socialism and communism. But let, let's not forget, Gough Whitlam tried to stop the Vietnamese refugees coming to Australia because he thought they'd all vote against the Labour Party because they were fleeing communism. 
The 60s and 70s were also the age of the counterculture, psychedelic drugs dropping out. We had a bizarre coalition between Marxism and hippiedom. We had people who really were apolitical throwing around words like bourgeois and fascist and saying they wanted to get rid of the existing order, but had no idea of what would, would replace it, except it would be a world where you could have as many drugs as you like and you never have to work. It's about the same time as the Beatles got mixed up with the Maharishi and went to India and went psychedelic. The John Lennon song, Imagine There's No Heaven, Imagine All the People Living as One, could be called the anthem of the multicultural, globalised new age. When Janis Joplin sang, Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose, that summed up, that was, that was, that was a put down for all the apologists for capitalism that summed up the entire works of Marx, Lenin, Engels, Mao, and Kimball Sung in one sentence. It suited the left to exploit the counterculture because it was just one more thing that might bring down capitalism. Though some differed. I can remember a letter in the Tribune communist newspaper lambasting them for printing what the writer called the Trotskyist crap of Dennis Freeney about taking drugs and dropping out because they thought in a socialist country everyone should have to work. Of course now, Paul McCartney is a multi-billionaire. If John Lennon was still alive, he'd be a multi-billionaire. Mm. Ten years after the demise of Whitlam, significant things happened. The Chinese communists suddenly discovered that it was a good thing to be rich. And the left and the West embraced economic rationalism, as when Hawke said that the economy had to have a, a healthy private sector as well as a healthy public sector. This is why the flavour of the Hawke years was totally different from the Whitlam years. Whitlam had nothing but contempt for private enterprise, and though Whitlam wasn't a revolutionary socialist, he thought that capitalism was at best a necessary evil, and the only people of real substance were people who worked in some arm of government. So fast forward to now, with the Chinese Communist Party finding it's good to be rich, and all their labour icons like Hawke and Keating being millionaires, and it might be any socialist who is a millionaire who, who dies rich is a phony, yeah. you've come a long way from the 60s. When Danny the Red, Daniel Curran Bendit, who I believe is now a big wheel in European dreams, proposed that under what do you call the new alternative to obsolete communism, everyone's wages should be the same whether you're a teacher, a doctor, or a street sweeper. A street sweeper. But I'd like the Labour Party to explain now why, while an average Labour voter works two jobs and still can only afford a two bedroom, five row house in a suburb no one's ever heard of, 20 miles west of Liverpool. <laughs> Multi-million dollar homes in the eastern suburbs are being bought up by rich corrupt officials of the Chinese Communist Party so they can keep their ill gotten gains into the hands of the government in Beijing. At the same time as the left discovered that private enterprise could be good, the so-called conservative parties discovered economic rationalism. In my opinion, that means they're really embracing dialectical materialism, an idea that the only thing that matters is material welfare the greatest good for the greatest number. So forget God, freedom, country, liberty, tradition, heritage, patriotism, free speech, whatever else the Conservative parties used to claim to stand for. If we close down all the factories and farms, import cheap goods from overseas, sell mining rights to the highest bidder, it doesn't matter. As long as in the end everything in the shops is 10% cheaper. If there's only two players in the retail game, it doesn't matter, because they employ lots of people, and they pay award wages, and they pay big returns to their, shareholder, to their shareholders. Or as Bill Clinton put it, it's the economy, stupid. Now Malcolm Turnbull, and I'll say a bit more about him later, says his policy is jobs, jobs, jobs. Which to me sounds like something you'd more likely to expect coming out from the lips of a depression era, a depression era communist. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing Andrew Peacock being interviewed when he became leader of the opposition and he said he joined the Liberal Party because he wanted a party where the emphasis was on the individual. And that used to be the difference between Liberal, the Liberals and the Labour Party, and the, between the Democrats and the Republicans in the US. The concept of the individual is against the concept of the collective. Now, if you ask a Liberal these days what he thought of that concept, he wouldn't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> these days, the only freedom the Liberal Party believe in is the freedom to make money. But what I say is, democracy is all very well. But democracy might just be a dictatorship by the majority. You've got to guarantee individual liberty. The Marxist says that the concept of the individual is an invalid bourgeois concept. 
because the only thing that matters is the well-being of the masses. But there's a flaw in that because the masses are individuals. Let's consider a speech by Malcolm Turnbull made to the London School of Economics recently. He gave this speech the peculiar title, Same Bed, Different Dreams. He was talking about Communist China. And remember, there are two Chinas. There's Communist China and there's the Republic of China, sometimes called Taiwan. So the Liberal and Labour policies of one China is all wrong. I can prove that because the people that come here from the Republic of China, Taiwan, they get on the Taiwanese passport. That proves there's two Chinas. As revealed in a book recently published by Frank Dakota, Mao's Great Famine, based on painstaking research in newly opened local archives, 45 million Chinese people died because of the Great Famine caused by Mao's communist communism during the so-called Great Leap Forward. The Chinese communist regime propped up the murderous Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, so must take a part in the guilt for the three million who died there. China is a, now a country where they kill political prisoners so they can cut out their organs and sell them. They drag women into and force them to have abortions and forcibly sterilise them if they contravene the one-child policy. And it was, it was publicised recently how a, a two-year-old toddler was hit by a car and laid in the street for two days before anyone took it to hospital. Some people might wonder how could that happen. Well, Chinese communism, after 60 years of Chinese communism, people have been taught not to care about other people. But also, if you pick up that toddler and took it to hospital, as an innocent bystander out of altruistic motives, you stand a good chance of being charged by the police of having to be the one that ran it over. Because in communist China, no one could believe anyone could do anything from altruistic motives. But what does Malcolm Turnbull say about China? He draws an evolutionary connection between the Mao suit, which in fact was a device to destroy the concept of the individual, and the modern Chinese CCP operatives strutting around the world doing business in neatly tailored, tailored business suits. He admits China is not a democracy, but calls the one-party dictatorship a social contract. Now, how can a dictatorship be a contract? A contract is a voluntary agreement between two parties. Like, we vote in the Gillard Brown government for a three-year contract, and at the end of three years, if we don't like it, we kick it out, which is simply not renewing the contract. He says the Communist Party of China presents as a modern political party. They, they send official delegations to the Liberal Party conferences in Australia. Did you know that? <laughs> Did anyone in this room get an invite to the Liberal Party conference as an Australian citizen? Did you get an invite, David? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to stand in with the Liberal Party conference and observe them? Does the Liberal Party get invited to the meetings of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party? <laughs> he describes the Japanese invasion of China as brutal, but makes no mention of the brutal Chinese communist invasion of Tibet, or the brutal way the communists seize power. See, this is why I get confused. I thought when communists come to power, they kill the rich people like Malcolm, Malcolm Turnbull, you know, the non-productive bankers and lawyers who just live off the labour of the working class and redistribute their wealth to the peasants. Then he says, quoting the dictator Mao, the Chinese people have stood up. What does Turnbull mean by China standing up? To possess the weapons of mass destru destruction? subjugating the people of Tibet, their sabre rattling towards Taiwan and that large chunk of eastern India which they lay claim to. Even in purely economic terms, China is a country where, unlike South Korea and the Republic of China, most people live in poverty. It's the most polluted country in the world. I defy anyone to name any invention, any quality manufactured, manufactured product or any cultural or artistic achievement that's come out of China since 1949 or of any other communist country since 1917. Oh, so I've got one thing, the AK-47s are very reliable. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull, he said that just certainly doesn't want Australia to stand up. If he has his way, Australia would be nothing but an accounting concept on the annual balance sheet of Golden Sachs, a big hole in the ground where multinational mining companies rip the mineral minerals out of the earth and export them with the profits going to their investors. And he certainly doesn't want Tibet to stand up. <clears throat> but it's not the first time coalition politicians have grovelled to the Chinese communists. On the 14th of September 1976, <clears throat> after Mao did the world a favour by dying, a condolence motion was moved in federal parliament. <clears throat> One MP said, 
He welded the diff difficult factions in China into cohesion with the United Nations. <clears throat> his achievement was remarkable by any standard. Another said, Mao devoted his life to a vision of a rigorously egalitarian society and secured the basic necessities of life for the Chinese people. He achieved peace internally. Another said, he organised great land reform. He was a humane head of a government. This is, they talk about the man who said political power comes out of the barrel of the gun. Right. So I suppose if you kill all the people who don't support you, all the rest of them will support you. Now, who said, was he, were these the words of Dr. Ken or Lionel Murphy? No. This was Doug Anthony, Malcolm Fraser, and Senator Reg Withers, who a few years before had sent 500 Australians to die in Vietnam to fight communism and contain China. And here's what the Labor MP said, Whitman. Under Mao's leadership, the Chinese people found the strength for a prodigious effort of a revolutionary struggle. He was the authentic father of his people in the new China. Tom Yuen. Mao was a great leader, a brilliant revolutionary thinker, an outstanding patriot. By the people of China, he was not only respected, he was loved. Mick Young. The first government in history to have the support of all the Chinese people. <coughs> Just for the record, Billy Wentworth spoke against the condolence motion. motion. No one else did. But Kevin Cairns, Cole Carini and Dick Klugman, the Labour MP, walked out. <coughs> walked out on it. It's not the first time the so-called Western democracies have groveled to dictators. <clears throat> Anyone who's old enough to remember ads used to have in magazines for stamina trousers and crusader clock. Do you remember those, Jenna? All good, all young Australian schoolboys wear well, stamina trousers and crusader clock. And I used to have a series of ads in magazines, men of stamina, and these were men Young Australian boys should look up, look up to heroic, brave, honest, just men. Mm -hmm. But this was 1944. Here's one, Charles de Gaulle. I think a few others, Winston Churchill, Baden Powell, Albert Schweitzer, Dr. Livingston. And do you know who another one was? Oh. Joseph Stalin. <laughs> Joseph Stalin. <laughs> well, what do they say about Joseph Stalin in 1944? This is one of the back of a walkabout Australian magazine. Stalin, man of steel, the son of a cobbler, is probably the most powerful human being in the world today. His perseverance is inhuman. His physical strength and endurance are enormous. He is a supreme organiser. He sure was. <laughs> he took over the Russian Revolution and made it work. Neither jail nor exile, nor revolts, nor the threat of assassination have daunted. Leading Russia to victory, he stands out preeminently as a man of stamina. So we had Mao, so we had, it was Stalin in 1944, in 2011 they sent, they sent, they're saying the same things about Mao. <clears throat> Apart from the criminality of all these words, what's scary is if they admire what Mao did, is this what the powers that be now have in store for us? Land reform, of course, means taking away everyone's land rights. <laughs> Are they looking at the CCP model and thinking, well, that's a pretty good way to run a country? A strong central government, a compliant media, no one being allowed to stand in the way of the almighty dollar. The way coal seam gas is being pushed through by both major parties, when it's manifestly obvious it's an infringement of property rights, it's going to pollute the environment, is how the Chinese Communist Party runs China. Yeah. You've got to understand that business, businesses want to make money out of China. They don't want democracy there. I used to work for a company that was a major, the age of all the textiles and garments coming in from communist China. And when the Tiananmen Square, Square massacre happened, one of the executives was asked, it must be hard doing business there now. He said, oh no, it's better there now because everyone does what they're told. <laughs> now, you see, what, what these people are all doing is denying the Chinese Holocaust. It should be a criminal offence to deny the Chinese Holocaust in the same way it is a criminal offence in some countries of Europe to deny the Nazi Holocaust. Right. There's no difference between David Irving making a statement like no one was ever gassed at Auschwitz and making a statement like Mao was an outstanding patriot and had the support of all the Chinese people. If we were to start locking people up for denying the Chinese Holocaust, it would be a great step forward for freedom in Australia. It would be one step to, to ensuring that we never end up living under socialism here. The farcical situation now is that 
The so-called extreme left wing party of the Greens, represented by my colleague Mr. Shoebridge, is the only party ready to condemn the Chinese communists by standing up for Tibet. And as they recently opposed the intrusion of the so-called Confucius Institutes into schools, which are simply an avenue for the Chinese Communist Party to brainwash Australian school students, the rosy picture, picture of the last 60 years of Chinese history, while the Liberals are suddenly on the side of the Chinese Communist Party. Contrary to what, what Kevin Rudd says, telling the truth about the Chinese Communist Party is the greatest moral challenge of our time. If, if the Vietnamese Communists had not overthrown the Khmer Rouge, and the Khmer Rouge was simply Maoists on steroids, the Khmer Rouge would have evolved into what Communist China is now. But when Pol Pot died, Liberal and Labour MPs would have, been, would have been getting up in Parliament saying, well, a great guy Pol Pot was, and saying what great things he had achieved for Cambodia, the same way as they grovelled to Mao. Instead of expressing admiration for Mao, who gave the world nothing but death, destruction, lies, slavery, war, a one-child policy, organ harvesting, oppression, corruption and pollution, the Malcolm Turnbulls and Malcolm Frasers of this world would be better off tying their colours to the mask of the Dalai Lama, who has given the world instead a message of peace, tolerance, forbearance, truth, patience, humility and humanity. Instead of having trade sanctions on digital countries like Fiji and basket cases like Zimbabwe, we should have trade sanctions against China, communist China. We should let them buy any of our products that they want, but refuse to buy any of their manufactured goods made of slave labour, or any of, or any of their contaminated, polluted food. And we should not allow them to buy real estate or mining rights in Australia. People will say they'll retaliate. I don't think they would. They buy our iron, iron, iron ore and cork coal because they need it. <coughs> so does anything stand in the way of the left? One thing is Islam. Demographic predictions say there's far to be a Muslim country in 50 years, which is why the socialists in the French parliament opted to ban the burqa. But why should the atheistic left be so sympathetic to a political movement like Islam that is a theocracy believes women should know their place as prescribed by the Koran, which stands for practically everything that the opposite is the opposite of what they believe in. The answer, Marx said religion is the aching of the masses. Mm -hmm. And to the left, all religions are equally ridiculous, a mental aberration. But the religion the left hates most is Christianity. And the great and the great Leninist tradition of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, they'll think they use they'll use Islam to de Christianize society, but when they've achieved their socialist paradise, all religions will disappear anyway. I find the parallel between the attitude of the left to Islam and the attitude of the communists in Germany in 1930 to the Nazis. When the Nazis appeared on the scene, they were dismissed by the communists as capitalism, capitalism in its death throes and not worth worrying about. And their real enemy was the social democrats. Because the social democrats were the fake socialists who might fool people into thinking they were going to change the system when they really weren't. So the communists concentrated on the Social Democrats. Then when the Nazis had taken over and the Communists and Social Democrats all in concentration camps, it was too late. <coughs> when, when, <coughs> when the Muslims take over a country, the first two people they get rid of is the Marxists. Marxism is anathema to a Muslim. The Mujahideen in Afghanistan killed 15,000 soldiers of the Communist USSR <coughs> when they tried to pop up a pro-Soviet government. Nasser said he could never be a good communist and a good Muslim. The pan arab Bar Party was founded partly to prevent communism from taking a foothold in the Middle East. In the last federal election, some of the biggest swings against Labour were in heavily Muslim polling booths in cities' western suburbs, where the swing was up to 18%. And the reason is, I know this, but no one liberal candidate went canvassing, because Muslims wouldn't vote for Julia Gillard. But she's a female, she's an atheist, she's pro-abortion and pro-Israel. This is an article from a Shiite Arab newspaper being circulated in Sydney. <clears throat> it concerned a tribe in, 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 in Arabia who Muhammad, Muhammad exterminated because they refused to convert to Islam. And what the article is saying is these people got what they deserve. It showed you the sections in the Muslim community uh, who think this way. Anyway, this is being passed on the Executive Council of Australian Jury, and these people might find themselves in court for uh, inciting racial hatred. 
So what's the solution to stopping the long march of the left of the institutions of the Western world? To become a Muslim? To infiltrate the Liberal or Labour Party and change their policy? I find it very frustrating. I was very impressed with the words of David Mattas, the Canadian lawyer, one of the two people who took on the might of China by exposing the organ harvesting when he said, when he was in Australia recently, I'm not easily frustrated. I don't try to watch history being made. I try to make history. No. And all I know is that Sir Joe Penelope Peterson said, I'll never resign from politics while these socialists and communists are around. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob, for that challenging for that challenging presentation. If, a bit of an, if anyone wants to examine in detail uh, the uh, texture and quality of the character of the late Joe Stalin, I recommend for them a very good book, uh, the biography of Stalin by Edvard Wojcicki, who used the declassified KGB archives. The book came out about 1996. It's excellent. It tells you what kind of fellow he was. And I'd just like to tell you that in <coughs> 1936, the Olympic... You might be interested in this, Bob. In 1936, the Olympic Games were held in Berlin. Nine years later, the Nazi regime crashed in ruins. In 1980, the Olympic Games were held in Moscow. Uh, Eleven years later, the Soviet Union crashed in ruins. Three years ago, the Olympic Games were held in Beijing. Uh, so uh, you can draw the necessary conclusions, can't you? Now, right, so much for the Olympic Games. Now, 